It's Halloween, and I interviewed an exorcist. I'll be right back. Hello there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike from TheGraciousGuest.org here with you for another episode of The Gracious Guest Show. If you haven't uh, seen this channel before, thanks for stopping by. Please subscribe, like this content, share it far and wide. I do all kinds of different things here, like uh, faith interviews, uh, looking into more mysterious kind of topics sometimes as they intersect with faith, faith and culture, book reviews, movie reviews, talking about education, all kinds of things here on The Gracious Guest Show that hopefully will help lead you more deeply into a flourishing human experience. That's that's really what I'm all about here, hoping for that, praying for that. So uh, today, as I mentioned, we're going to jump into this topic that we visited before, uh, dealing with exorcism and spiritual warfare. And before I had, a couple months ago at the time of this recording, I was able to interview Father John Zeta. You can also check out that uh, link below as well. I have it linked there. Uh, our diocesan exorcist here in the Diocese of Harrisburg. And that video got a tremendous amount of, of response uh, and a lot of really good feedback. Um, and so that really got me thinking that this is a topic that really seems to resonate with a lot of people. And it's very important to try to do it well um, and to not uh, over embellish anything, but also not downplay the reality and the really urgent importance that this topic, I think, uh, has within it. So uh, I reached out to Father Vincent Lampert, who many of you have probably seen before. Father is uh, routinely as one of the exorcists who actually has, has decided to allow himself to be publicly known and not uh, kept sort of a secret, you know, um, so as to kind of protect his, his identity and, and his ability to, uh, to do his ministry. Father has discerned that this is a really uh, important ministry that he personally feels he can best do having more of a, a, a public uh, presence, be able to speak on this issue, to have people contact him directly. And he was very gracious to, uh, to uh, agree to interview uh, with me here today. So to share a little bit about Father's background, Father Vincent Lampert was born in 1963, and he studied for the priesthood at St. Meinrad College in Indiana at the univers and at the University of St. Mary of the Lake in Mundelein, Illinois. He was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, Indiana on June 1st, 1991. Father has been a priest for over 32 years and currently serves as the pastor of St. Michael and St. Peter Parishes in Brookville, Indiana. In 2005, he was appointed the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. He received his training in Rome and is a member of the International Association of Exorcists. He is also the author of the book Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons by Emmaus Road Publishing, which you can check out below as well. And without further ado, I want to jump right into my Halloween conversation with exorcist Father Vincent Lampert. Check it out. All right, Father Vincent Lampert, thanks so much for joining me on the Gracious Guest Show today. It's good to be with you, Mike. Well, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to chat with you. I think I mentioned to you before, you know, that um, this is a, a topic or a series of topics that's always been interesting to me. And I think it is probably, it, it seems to be for, for an awful lot of people, but of course, you know, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this, there's, uh, you know, some potential areas we have to be careful, you know, so as to not, um, um, basically create false impressions or, or, or get people, you know, too interested in the, uh, the tactics of, of the enemy where it could be, you know, in the worst sense, maybe a glorification or sort of certainly anything like that. So it's, you know, it's a topic that, you know, I thought about for a long time and um, and had uh, our diocesan exorcist here, Father John Zeta, on back in the summer. And the response to that was extraordinary. And it really showed me that there's an awful lot of people that, that have a real interest in this topic. So um, I reached out to you and you're gracious enough to join us here. And um, and I thought I'd just start off maybe asking you, you know, similarly, like I did with Father Zeta, just maybe a quick overview of your own background and maybe especially how you how did you become an exorcist? How does that happen? <laughs> I was appointed back in 2005. Okay. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis has always had a priest in this role, even when it fell out of practice after the Second Vatican Council. So India has always had a priest in the role. The exorcist of the Archdiocese died in July of 2005. Ironically, he was the pastor of the parish where I attended grade school. Oh. So uh, never imagine one day. <laughs> I'd have one of his jobs. So when he <laughs> passed away, the archbishop was looking for a replacement. That was Archbishop Daniel Beekline. He was a Benedictine monk from St. Mm -hmm. Meinrad in southern Indiana. 
and uh, he was the rector of the college when I attended there. So he knew me. So perhaps because of our connection with one another, he believed that I was the good candidate for the job. He even told me, I have no idea what I'm asking you to do. But because we've <laughs> always had a priest in the role, he goes, I don't want to break that continuity. And I was planning sure. to be on sabbatical in Rome in the early part of 2006. So he said, while you're there, this is something that you can try to study as well. The church sure. says the best way to learn the ministry is through the apprenticeship model to work under a seasoned exorcist. But at the time I was appointed, there were probably only 12 stably appointed exorcists in the entire United States. And because mm. there was so few, there really wasn't anyone to train under. So when I arrived in Rome in February of 2006, I was able to connect with a Franciscan priest, Father Carmine de Philippus. He was trained along with uh, Father Gabriel Amorth, mm -hmm. usually a name that people recognize. Sure. By Father Candido Amentini, who was a passionist priest. He's now servant of God. But he did oh, exorcisms wow. at the Holy Stairs there in Rome near the Basilica of St. John Lateran. So both Father Carmine and Father Gabriel Amorth basically studied under him. Sure. And then Father Carmine allowed me then to sit in on 40 exorcisms that he performed during the three months I lived in Rome. And then that allowed me to learn firsthand the church's ministry to those who are up against the forces of evil and who are seeking the help of the church. Hmm. Well, and, and that's, uh, I was thinking about this, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, you'll hear you know, spiritual warfare mentioned, or I, I've always heard that, you know, when I was, when I was a kid and growing up and I've, I've taught it now as, as a you know theology teacher and in ministry, but I, I at least in my experience, it, it sometimes really seems to come across as, as, you know, an analogy, you know, it's like warfare, but, you know, it seems more and more apparent that there's this, uh, at least what seems to me, at least in terms of the reporting and, and you know, interviews that are out there. Uh, have you seen a, a, a real surge even since you started doing this ministry in this literal, you know, <laughs> spiritual warfare of, of people very much grappling with these, uh, not literary devices, right, but these actual demonic uh, entities? Yeah, there's a lot of people that may discount the belief that evil is personified in what we call the devil and these other fallen angels. However, the church is consistently taught about the reality of evil. Even Pope Paul VI back in 1972, in one of his Wednesday general audiences, he said that evil is not just a metaphor for humanity's inhumane treatment of one another, but it is something real and personified. There's a lot of people that would say that Jesus, even the accounts of him doing exorcisms in the Bible, that Jesus knew these people weren't possessed they say, but he was just feeding into the mentality of the day. Hmm. But that mindset fails to recognize that when Jesus sent his apostles out, he gave them authority over un unclean spirits and also the ability to heal the sick. So Jesus makes a very clear distinction between a malady that's caused by demonic influence and something that is of a physical nature. And if Jesus hmm. makes the distinction, we should certainly continue to do that today. Sure. Yeah. And I think um, I've seen certainly with um, with students, because I, I mostly teach high school, and whenever this topic comes up, and it doesn't come up a lot, you know, like we don't have a whole uh, unit per se dedicated to it. And like I said earlier, I'm very delicate with, especially their age group, you know, you don't want to um, g get a, a, um, an attachment going or any sort of, mm -hmm. of, of interest that could become dangerous. But there's also a lot of um, I find, you know, a lot of, of need to sort of clarify what the church means uh, uh, by demon and means by um, possession and oppression. And could you just maybe walk us through a little bit here? You know, what, what's, I'm sure some viewers have seen this before, but perhaps a, a distinction here in terms of the actual uh, ministry of exorcism in the church, what these different levels yeah. actually are like possession or obsession or, or uh, oppression, mm -hmm. these you know, different terms. You know, when I was appointed 18 years ago, I probably only got a handful of inquiries a year from people who believe they were dealing with the demonic. I am publicly known, so I, I realize I probably get a maybe a larger volume of people reaching out to me. But mm, sure. I currently receive 3,500 requests a year from people wow. all over the United States and even other parts of the world who believe they're up against demonic forces and are seeking the help of the church. 
A lot of times mm-hmm. these people believe that they're possessed. You know, the church recognizes four different types of extraordinary demonic activity. Demonic possession, whereby the devil or some evil spirit would take control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. For example, using the person's eyes to see, their mouth to speak, their ears to hear. And it's always important to make the clear distinction between that person as an individual and now the demon who's using that body as if it were its own. Because once Mm. the demon manifests, all the actions of that body are now wholly defined by the demon and no longer by that person. So, for example, if I was working with John Doe, I wouldn't say that John Doe did this or said that. I would say Mm. the demon did that. Again, the demon is now the one who's controlling that body. There's also demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location or associated with an object. There can be demonic uh, obsession, which are mental attacks. Literally, the devil's trying to get inside of someone's head so that everything they think is being filtered through the presence of the of the devil. Hmm. Then there is demonic vexation. These are physical attacks. I prefer the word vexation yeah. because uh, some people use the term oppression, but I believe okay. that demonic oppression is a gift from God. Someone didn't do something hmm. wrong that created an entry point for the demonic, but God permitted it to happen. And you can think hmm. of like Job in the Old Testament, He didn't do anything wrong, but God permitted him to be afflicted as an opportunity for Job to show his fidelity to God. No, it's easy. Would that be like like Padre Pio, perhaps, as well? Yeah, absolutely. Padre Pio. He's a a great example. St. Paul himself talked about the thorn in his flesh, the messenger from Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. Hmm. So there are some people that God allows them to experience some demonic oppression and again they didn't do anything wrong to create the entry point but god is permitting it as an opportunity for that person to show their fidelity to god with the end result that somebody is greatly blessed and they grow more deeply in holiness and virtue gotcha that's a good uh i'm making a note here (laughs) that's that's a good distinction um and you know i suppose there's like we look around us and and there's so many i mean potential entry points i i imagine for for this sort of thing and i, I guess you know i have a couple of questions related to this but one would just be maybe the basic one and i'm sure you get asked this a lot uh just in, even in your own experience or in the experience of other exorcists you speak with what what seems to be pretty consistent enduring kind of uh entry points for people or maybe even I don't know, like specific age frames where this might be more prevalent than others. You know, I'm curious about that. You know, I think there's several main entry points that I've seen over the years. Probably the the more dominant one would be ties to the occult. Because the word occult comes from the Latin word occultus. It means secret or hidden. It focuses on knowledge of the paranormal. And hmm. occult activity is a violation of the first commandment where God says, I am the Lord your God, you shall not have strange gods before me. And when people turn to the world of the occult, again, think of things like playing with the Ouija board, magic and witchcraft, going to see a psychic or a medium, the use of crystals, tarot cards, because somebody is looking for a substitute for God. And the sin in all of that is idolatry. It's really the sin that's condemned a lot within the Old Testament. You know, the Israelites that were on a journey to the promised land would give in to perhaps some of the religious practices of their neighbors. Even in the book of Psalms, I think it's Psalm 95, verse 5, it says, the gods of the nations are demons. Mm -hmm. So when the Israelites went away from the worship of the one true God and gave in to these religious practices of their neighbors, they gave in to the sin of idolatry. And the danger behind the world of the occult is that there's a power there, but it's not the power of God, it's the power of the evil one. And when somebody turns to the world of the occult, then they're giving authority to the demonic to act in their life. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people may turn to the occult looking for quick and easy answers, maybe trying to consult the spirits of the dead. And initially things may be, they may seem to be good. And usually the demonic does that as a way to lure people into a false sense of security. 
But eventually, if the devil is going to bestow a favor, if you will, he's going to expect to be paid. And ultimately, mm -hmm. people that turn to the world of the occult can quickly find their lives beginning to spiral downwards and out of control. Sure. I suppose and this this may be some speculation, but I'm, I'm just curious, you know, like you, you see reports of certain time periods, you know, where you get like a, a heightened spike of interest in, in the occult or, or seances, for example, like I've, I've read that after World War One, just because of the astonishing devastation and how many people uh, lost significant numbers of loved ones in such a short amount of time and the Spanish flu right after it, that you had this this real spike uh, and that kind of interest. Do you suppose that in, in our time, it may not be for the same reasons, but perhaps, uh, I mean, my, my personal feeling on it for what it's worth is that, you know, we have for so many decades, so many generations now tried to convince ourselves maybe as a society that either there is no supernatural, you know, uh, that doesn't exist at all, or it can just be whatever you want it to be in this sort of vague, um, uh, I heard it referred to as, um, moralistic theistic you know deism or something like therapeutic deism that kind of thing do you suppose that i'm just curious and then your experience do you think that that uh that that those cultural trends themselves could be you know preparing the way for a lot of folks to fall into this sort of thing i think that's absolutely true because you look at the world in which we live today and it it's becoming less religious faith in god will lead us in one direction and the lack of faith in another you know, there are many stats out there that would say that the majority of, you know, I think it's now one out of every five Americans claims to be an atheist. Even if they mm -hmm. grew up in a traditional Christian home, there is a rejection of that Christian identity. You think about it, Christianity built Western civilization, and now we're turning our backs on that. I think that's why we see an identity crisis. We don't really know who we are or whose we are, namely God. And so people then are questioning, you know, do we really need God? And that's really the original temptation. Going back to the book of Genesis, where the serpent says to Eve, did God really tell you? What's interesting in that mm -hmm. statement is that even the devil, he's not an atheist. He knows that God exists, <laughs> but he wants us to live as if God did not exist. And the way that we do that is by deifying ourselves. And there's a lot of sure. people today, we deify ourselves three guiding principles. You may do whatever you wish. Nobody has the right to command you, and you are the God of yourself. Mm. But I believe that the human person has the innate desire for God. And if we don't foster that desire for God, that's where I think we see a lot of the brokenness and polarization in society today. You know, when God is removed from the equation, humanity doesn't get better. It gets more chaotic. Even St. Augustine you know, he gave the great line where he says, in reference to God, you have created us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So I do sure. believe the human person has that deep longing for God. But when it's not fostered, that's where we see the likes of what's going on in the world today. Hmm. It's almost like the... um. Uh, super nature seems to abhor a vacuum just as much as as, as nature does too. You know, something's going to fill that. Um, well, let me ask you, Father. You know, like I said a little bit at, at the outset here. You know, we, I, 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 I'm tempted to always. You know, like there's there's this temptation to you know with like let's you know let's hear these shocking stories and all that, but we don't, of course, want to focus on the the the, the powers that these demons have more than the glory. And the power of the of the exorcist or the exorcism or the, the ritual of mm -hmm. of uh, and even more so right the, the sacraments right the sacrament of confession I forget uh, some uh, exorcist I heard or was quoting a saint I forget who it was who said something to the effect of you know one you know uh, sacramental confession is is more powerful than like ten thousand exorcists something mm -hmm. like that you know that the that we have this grace from the Lord so but with that in mind just to I don't know to, to perhaps cue people in a little bit, I, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing, you know, in terms of your own experience, you know, um, you know, what, what are maybe some examples of the kinds of things or even categories of, of things that, uh, that can materialize in some of these, these, you know, phenomena, mm -hmm. um, if someone is, is, let's say, genuinely, uh, possessed. It's important to note that the devil can't do anything that God does not permit him to do. So the devil is still on a leash, doesn't have free reign. If the devil had free reign, 
the world would be a lot crazier than it already is. Mm -hmm. And the devil may have been cast out of heaven, but he wasn't cast out of creation. So he still has a role to play. So even in cases of extraordinary demonic activity, again, the infestation, the vexation, obsession, and possession, all of that can be used for the glory of God. Because ultimately, the enemy will only attack where he believes there's a weakness. And I always mm -hmm. tell people that if the devil has allowed you to see a weakness in your spiritual armor, then you know where you need to put in some more time and effort to shore up that area. So we can take what the devil is doing to us and use it to our advantage. Certainly, when it comes to the world of exorcism, people are always more fascinated by demonic possession. You look at mm -hmm. a movie like The Exorcist. There's right. a couple of new movies that just came out. Uh, Nefarious, yeah. The Pope's Exorcist. And mm -hmm. I think there's a new one coming out uh, that, yet this month here in October called yeah. Exorcist Believer. Okay. A lot of what Hollywood yeah. focuses on in these movies is the power of the demonic. I think they get it right on the manifestations. Those things mm -hmm. happen. They are real. But the devil is trying to instill fear because when you can cause somebody to live in fear, then you can control them. But as a person of faith, we move out of fear and we move into and hope and love. And then we mm -hmm. come to realize that certainly the power of God is greater than the power of the evil one. I've witnessed many, many examples of you know, signs of demonic possession where eyes will roll in the back of the head, fo foaming at the mouth, growling and snarling. I've witnessed uh, the demonic manifest, which caused the person's body to drop to the ground and begin to slither like a snake. I've witnessed mm. a body actually levitate and rise in the air. There are all kinds of bodily contortions. And basically what the demonic is trying to do is to lash out at God, because the human person has been created in the image and likeness of God. So we have the divine image. That even kind of begs the question, why is the devil interested in possessing a human body? And the answer lies yeah. at the very core of our Christian faith. What's the greatest thing that God did for us? The incarnation God took sure. on human form. And because the devil wishes to mimic God in every possible way, he believes that he takes on human form by possessing a human body. But when he does so, he basically makes a mockery of the human person. That's why you see the howling and the hysteria, uncontrollable sure. laughter. Uh, I did an exorcism one time when the demon manifested and the person's eyes turned green and their, per their pupils became slanted like a, a serpent. And the voice wow. says to me, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long and you're not strong enough. But again, mm. it's all about instilling fear and mocking the human person because God took on human form. God didn't take on angelic form. And even right. Lucifer before the fall, somehow it's believed that he could see God's plan for humanity, and he could not accept the fact that human flesh would be elevated higher than himself. First by, mm. by God taking on human form, and then think of the role of our Blessed Mother becoming Queen of Heaven, Queen of the Angels. So he kind of felt like he was being, I don't know, downgraded, so to speak, and just could not accept that. That's why the mentality of the devil usually is it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Sure. Well, and I, I'm wondering about, you know, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the uh, the C.S. Lewis series, the uh, the Ransom trilogy. Do you ever I don't know if you ever read those or or not? Yeah, the, well, uh, yes. the the space trilogy, and I, I've always been intrigued by. A couple places in there, especially in the second book, where he depicts this character, you know, this this uh, scientist Weston who has given himself over, you know, to these evil forces. And you know, Lewis is not a, um, you know, he's he's not Catholic. He's he's not an exorcist. You know, he's but but, but his depiction I always find very compelling in a few ways of some things I, I feel like he might be getting at. And I'm just I'm curious because um, he depicts basically at one point, if I remember correctly, this this demon. Who he's he's fighting with? He's having these these conversations, trying to protect a, a a new Eve figure from falling. That's kind of the story. Spoiler for those. Who, <laughs> but what's fascinating is 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 he keeps kind of feeling like he's losing, and he's up against this this ancient intellect, right? And it's it's scary to to the main character. You know, he's just a man, but he's up against this 
this demon basically who's so much smarter than him or more intellectual but then when he's he's off out of these conversations with the lady it just uh, lewis describes at length these periods where this demon just like mutilates frogs and just does these incredibly like nagging annoying nasty kinds of things um and he explores through that um this idea that that something even as beautiful as the angelic intellect the 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 nature that this beautiful, amazing creature had, it hates that. It doesn't care about that. It, it basically uses it like a weapon. And whenever it's done using it as a weapon for a few minutes, it just completely is this, this empty, shallow, decayed kind of thing. And I'm just, I'm wondering if, if anything in your experience has kind of backed some of that up as far as, you know, this, this thing is just mocking everything, even the, the intellect and the powers, you know, that God made, um, it capable of harnessing. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we would recognize that these fallen angels are imperfect creatures. The belief is that when God created the angelic world, he gave them infused knowledge. That's why signs of demonic possession, the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having elevated perception, those could be signs of demonic possession. But those are also angelic qualities and traits based on their intellect. But God created the angels, gave them infused knowledge, and then basically said, with all the knowledge I've given you, will you now complete your formation, your creation, and turn and unite your free will with mine? And then the belief is that Lucifer, along with one-third of the angelic choir, said no. You know, an angel in a higher choir will um, illumine those in a lower choir. So we can say that when Lucifer chose to rebel, that decision reverberated through the nine choirs of angels and then one third of the angelic choir embraced lucifer's rejection mm. of god and then they were cast out of heaven so they're imperfect creatures they still retain their intellect as you suggest but it's now darkened it's distorted because it's no longer being constantly illumined by the glory of god i give mm. the, the analogy you know I, I have six brothers and two sisters and when we were all kids, we used to play, love to play with these rubber balls that would glow in the dark. So we'd go into a room yeah. and we'd put it up against the light bulb. Then we'd turn out the light and then it would glow. But eventually the glow would fade if it wasn't constantly fed by the light. Sure. And Lucifer is no longer fed by the, the light or the glory of God. So he's trapped in, in total darkness. That's why mm -hmm. his intellect is distorted. It's in darkness. It's you know, creepy. There's sure. nothing good that comes from that. That's sure. why probably a good statement to make is even though Lucifer was the greatest of the angelic creatures, our guardian angels are more powerful than the devil himself. Sure. Because an angel from a lower choir who chose to unite his will with the will of God is more powerful than a higher ranking angel who rejected God, which is why sure. anybody who believes they're dealing with the demonic should always appeal to their guardian angel. And we know that during October, it's also the time that we celebrate the feast of the guardian angels. Yeah. Well, and right on the heels of the, the archangels. And then uh, I was thinking of course of, of St. Joseph. I love it just in the last few years that that title of terror of demons, you know, cause he's not even an angel, <laughs> you know, and, but, but because of his proximity, you know, to the, to our Lord, there's this uh -huh. just, unmatched power um and that's encouraging you know for sure and a great example oh. i think that we learned from saint joseph and even pope benedict touched on this is that we learn a lot from saint joseph in his silence we don't really hear him ever speak anything but we see examples of him where like an angel appeared to him in a dream and says god says to take the child and his mother and flee to egypt so it's hmm. his silence his obedience to god that is so powerful. And that's really what the devil hates. If he's all about disobedience and pride, anyone that's about obedience and, you know, humility is certainly going to uh, cause the devil to literally go crazy. I mean, we think of our Blessed Mother, <laughs> the greatest example of obedience and humility that we as a human race can have. Sure. Well, that's... Um... There's a couple couple paths I'm thinking of going down here, but but I wonder if I've never shared this before, um, you know, kind of publicly. I wanted to mention this, and um, 
you know, for what it's worth, you know, so I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot to verify anything, you know, you know <laughs> without, without, uh, you know, do investigation, but just to share my, my own, um, uh, little experience. But I, I had this, this, um, experience I always felt was, was some kind of on some level, um, maybe crossing paths with something, you know, demonic, at least that was my suspicion and always has been where, um, you know, I wasn't in any occult stuff or anything. I was just, I, I was basically in my dorm room and, um, and it was, it was just the way I described it was bizarre. I just, I, I, it felt like the sound and so much, it happened so quick when this was like all in like after, after the fact, like looking back on it, but I, I always describe it as it felt like the, like someone just drained the sound slowly out of the room and th there was no actual change in, in any, and my friends were watching TV in the next room. Um, and it just felt quieter and quieter. Um, and I tell people like, you know how it feels when, you think you're in a room alone and then someone is also in the room and you just have that sense that someone else is there. I said, it felt a lot like that. And very suddenly, and with that kind of, I said the, the room felt like it got noticeably colder. Mm -hmm. And though the lights didn't flicker, there was no like actual obvious um, discernible sort of visual difference. I just said, it just felt dark. And I said, it was a darkness I've never felt before or since. It felt like something that was itself darkness and despair and anger and misery, like this personification of those things was just there. And I was absolutely just petrified. Like I was frozen. You know, I just could not move at all. I was fully aware. I wasn't asleep or anything. And I just, I don't know, it was a few seconds. And then I just started this, this, this holy righteous indignation built up in me, <laughs> you know, this attitude of whatever this, this, like, this is not of Christ. I did not welcome this in here. This does not belong. And I just started praying the name of our Lord very calmly. I just started finding this, that I was able to move again. And I just basically was saying, you know, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. Like it's this, you, you know, you don't belong here. And it was just like the sound came back up. The room was the regular temperature. You know, and I'm just sitting there like, what the, and I've, I've always believed that that was just a little moment early on in my sort of faith growth that, that perhaps, you know, uh, the Lord may be in a real direct way, or maybe he allowed me to get a sense at least of what it would be like. Again, I'm not, you know, sort of diagnosing it, but that's, I, I share that story sometimes with folks just as a, my own little, for what it's worth, you know, mm -hmm. it, if, if that was legit, I, I feel like I got a taste of you know, the personification truly of, of what it would mean to, to reject all of that, you know, that glory and that joy. And, um, it's not something I want to be part of. <laughs> I can confirm that for, uh, you know, just out of my experience yeah. there. That story just makes me think of the reality that, you know, the devil can watch us and observe us. The devil doesn't know what we're thinking, but because he's very intellectual, he can use deductive reasoning to kind of speculate what we might be thinking sure. or how we might act. And then maybe for some reason, the demonic felt that maybe there was an opportune moment in your life to see if he could present himself and mm -hmm. to see if you would welcome him in. You know, the great image of Jesus in the book of Revelation in chapter three, he stands at the door and knocks. We have to let him in. And I think it's pretty common for people to maybe have the devil knock at their door, if you will, mm. and to see if people will open the door and let him in. You know, the devil can propose, sure. but he cannot impose. He can suggest right. that we do something. You know, you think of the story of Eve again. The serpent didn't take the forbidden fruit and cram it down her throat. She <laughs> had to make the choice. He just wanted to present it as something that was good. And I think that's, you know, I think the devil does that to us in our lives. There's a lot of young people out there, especially in college, it's usually when a lot of people may be losing their faith, they get caught up in a lot of other things. And, you know, maybe you just had mm -hmm. an, an episode in your life where the devil, again, and God had to permit it, just wanted to see if he could get a foothold in your life. Sure. Well, and I wonder, too, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would have thought of it, you know, I, I'm maybe not that moment, but I can think of moments, you know, there, there's a temptation maybe sometimes to a some kind of power or control I, I imagine right that just comes from our <laughs> you know the the realization of just how little we really have you know about certain things and and i i wonder if that's a big thing especially maybe for for young people with all those those pressures especially at that kind of college 
or, you know, high school into college, early adulthood years, where you start to really maybe see those things that are maybe outside your control, the things that we should be turning into prayer and into faith. But maybe those are great opportunities, you know, tactically, I imagine, for, for the enemy to say, hey, I can help you with that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you know, say say these incantations or you know meet these people um do you do you encounter you know folks who who maybe thought that they were just dabbling in something innocent or just trying to deal with something like that and then they they end up really in over their heads perhaps because a lot of things of the occult world can be of an int a, an introductory level if you will you know maybe somebody plays with a a Ouija board Back in 2017, I was traveling to South Africa for exorcism ministry, and I was in the airport there in Atlanta, and they were selling voodoo dolls in the gift shop. At the now, airport. <laughs> now, granted, they're not authentic, yeah, but they're kind of just as a, a way to just simply get a foothold into people's lives. Yeah. So maybe somebody buys one of those out of a sense of curiosity. But then it really leads them into wanting to know more about the world of the occult and magic and voodoo. And so mm -hmm. it can lead them down a very bad and wrong path. So I sure. think there's a lot of people that, you know, they may think that something is just fun and entertaining. But people can open up an entry point for the demonic, either directly or indirectly. Just because we think something is entertaining doesn't mean the devil is not going to use that as an opportunity to get that foothold in our lives. So we just need sure. to be cautious about the things that we do. You know, most of us will never have to be worried about extraordinary demonic activity, the infestation, the vexation, obsession, and possession. But all of us do need to be very much aware of how the devil tries to trap us in the ordinary circumstances of our life. And mm -hmm. I always say it's a four-stage plan of attack. It begins with deception. The devil gets us to buy into his lies. The deception leads to division. We find ourselves broken. And then when we find ourselves broken, that division leads to deception or to diversion. We look for a substitute, something that we believe will help put the pieces of our lives back together, something that ultimately only God can do. And then that diversion eventually leads to discouragement. And discouragement, and I do think there's more people discouraged today than there are people who are depressed. And to really be discouraged means one is lacking any true meaning, purpose, or direction in their life. And when people arrive sure. at discouragement, it's a crossroads. One pathway leads to death, always spiritual, the complete rejection of God. Again, go back to the rising number of so-called atheists in society today. Sometimes that death is even physical. Think of the rising mm -hmm. trend of suicide in our society. But yeah. again, as the people of faith, the other pathway leads to discipleship. We have a reawakening of the important role and place that God needs to have in our lives. And so we then welcome God back or perhaps welcome him for the very first time. But I do sure. think a lot of times when people turn to the world of the occult, they're searching for something to put the pieces of their life back together. But again, only God can do that. You know, I met with a, two brothers in Indianapolis many years ago. They were from Mexico. And the one brother contacted me. and He goes, I'm concerned about my brother because he worships Satan. So I went to their apartment. And his, the brother really wasn't happy to see me. But mm -hmm. he showed me in his room an altar to Satan that he had created. And in his room, there was no furniture, no carpeting, no pictures, no curtains. The only thing mm. in his room was the altar to Satan and broken glass scattered all over the floor. And this young man would lie on top of the broken glass, prostrate oh, wow. in front of the image of Satan on the altar. And mm. that really reflects what Satan is all about. It's brokenness. You know, yeah. Jesus came to heal and to help put the pieces of our lives back together. But Satan ultimately only wants to divide. It's the notion divide and conquer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Cause you know, when you mentioned about these, um, you know, back to the, you know, also like the you know, people getting in over their head or they think you know, like the, the a gateway of like a little doll, you know, that's not a 
authentic voodoo doll, but it could lead to other things. Um, that's, I think, maybe a nice segue into, I wanted to spend a little time talking with you here as the title <laughs> suggested for folks, lest they think I was just clickbaiting them and not delivering, so to speak, on, on what I had promised. I did want to talk to you a little bit about Halloween, of course, because this episode, you know, we're we're kind of bookending this. We're recording this in uh, early October, right near the beginning of the month, um, you know, Halloween at the end of the month. And, you know, just anecdotally, I, I don't know <laughs> what your experience has been, but, you know, I, uh, I'm i almost 40, you know, g- growing up in the you know 80s, 90s, you know, we had trick or treat, there's Halloween stuff out, there's Halloween specials, some of it more, uh, you know, maybe wholesome than others. But I, I don't know if it's it's just I've noticed more of it or whatever it is, but I really feel like in my just adult years, these last maybe 15 years or so, uh, you know, it just seems like it lasts longer and longer. Um, there's more and more stuff that's available for sale everywhere. I mean, you have these stores that are a Christmas store, you know, year round. And there's our Halloween section, you know, where it's <laughs> a third of the store's Halloween stuff. And, um, you know, I don't know, there's a certain fun that maybe people have with the decorating. And, and uh, I have, you know, friends, I have family who do even pretty impressive Halloween decorations and such. And so uh, I guess I, I thought, you know, among other things, you know, maybe I could ask you here a little bit about, um, you know, what, what is the, the truth here with some of the, the history maybe of Halloween um, as it relates to, to all, Hall- all Hallows Eve mm-hmm. um, and, and some sort of Catholic underpinning to this. Um, I've heard some traditions where like you would dress up in these ghoulish ways to basically mock, right. The devil's, efforts and to, to, to mock death because Christ has been victorious. But that definitely is not, you know, what's going on at Spirit Halloween or like these stores and with all of these uh, more and more grotesque displays we see even year round, you know, in, in a lot of uh, performances and stuff like that and concerts. You know, what's what do you think's going on with with this <laughs> this, you know, new kind of you know Halloween that, that I think is, is really so prevalent? I don't think it's ever healthy to see the devil everywhere. That certainly mm. would not where we would want to be. But I do think that we need to be, we need, we do need to make sure that we're not doing things to glorify the evil one. And unfortunately, I think Halloween has really evolved into that. It's now the second largest spending holiday in the United States right after Christmas. Mm. Wow. And I even, I would put Halloween under the, the uh, category of the entertainment industry, which is, can also be another entry point for the demonic into a person's life. I mean, people today are really, really fascinated by the devil. Now, if you look at the history of Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, it was the belief that the spirits and souls of the dead could come back on that one particular night. And so people would dress up in costumes to act like one of these creatures, if you will, kind mm. of to blend in so that they wouldn't be afflicted or attacked. You know, I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with children wanting to have fun or getting candy. I mean, you're a kid. You know, you use your imagination. (laughs) You want candy. That's pretty normal. But one doesn't have to dress up like the devil or some other hideous creature. And you're right. You know, I'm 60 years old now. And, you know, when I was a kid, you might get an old sheet and throw it over your head and cut out a couple right. <laughs> eyeballs and walk down the street and hope to get a few snicker bars or whatever. Right. That but mask now, with that really bad rubber band, you know, that would snap and yeah, that's <laughs> always. <laughs> but now, I mean, I, I see yard displays with these skeletons and demons and yeah. people hang witches and whatnot from trees that have tombstones in their yards and like black cats. So it's feeding into mm-hmm. superstition as well. Which is from like mid September, you know, into like November. Yeah. Uh. So I think, yeah, the danger, I would say that the danger with Halloween is that it's the devil's trap. Mm -hmm. And we actually give him the avenue in which he can try to get a foothold into our lives. Because again, with by Halloween, we're we're glorifying the devil and his activities. You know, every time Mm -hmm. I think of Halloween, and I was born in 1963, and there was a song in 1969 by Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and it says, I know I, I swear there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell. Pray there ain't no hell, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of people who reject God. But if you reject God and you are doing things to, to glorify and give glamour to evil, 
I would suggest that that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. Because again, if we give the devil an opportunity to afflict us, he will take advantage of that. Yeah. And I wonder too, if there's not a, a, I'm just curious because it's, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure where I fall yet on the whole, and I'm not telling our our viewers like, you know, do or do not do trick or treat, you know, like, because again, I think it depends on, you know, you know, your, your, your neighborhood, who you're doing it with. Like, I mean, some areas there's more grotesque stuff than others. I, I think it's a difficult thing for parents to navigate, you know, but, um, I wonder, you know, the, I just forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> what were we saying with, with, um, th- these, potential doorways, you know, for, for the devil. I mean, anything that could create this, this false sense of, of power. Um, cause I, I, that's what I was going with. I wonder if there isn't a, a psychological even, you know, danger too, that could of course connect and dovetail with a spiritual danger of the, the sort of thrill you can get from scaring somebody. And I think, you know, I mean, we've, we've done it. I, I occasionally, you know, you get that moment, you know, playing with my daughters running around the house and you jump out and scare them. And that's just all well and good. But that can, you know, how, how where's that line to the point where, yeah. you know, when I scare you, it's, it's like, I have some sort of, you know, power over you. I'm creating this atmosphere where, you know, it's like my own little kingdom. And I, I don't know, I, I just, I feel like that can um, pretty obviously maybe, you know, get people so, I don't know. It's like an adrenaline rush. You know, like, when's that going to stop? You know, why wouldn't you just keep doing that in June? (laughs) You know, or July, keep keep it going all year. I mean, people do. Think of of, uh, ghost hunting. You know, people, I was in Savannah, Georgia a few years ago with some family, and we were out taking a walk in the evening, and all these people were getting on the the local buses to go on the the haunted tour. This Mm -hmm. is in the summertime. So there is sure. that great fascination with evil. And you're right. It's not just. We, we live know, like 20 minutes away from Gettysburg. So uh-huh. that's a huge, <laughs> a huge thing there. Yeah. So it's not just October 31st anymore. It's no. it's really year round. But I think the devil uses Halloween as a way to try to take over the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. Again, all these shows on television, ghost hunting, paranormal activity. You know, just because yeah. somebody claims that they're seeing a ghost, most exorcists will tell you that these so-called ghosts are really demons that are mm-hmm. masquerading as perhaps ones who have died just as a way for people to get fascinated with them. And then when people then fix their attention on these entities, these creatures, then it gives them the ability to begin to attack people and to instill mm-hmm. that sense of fear in them. Hmm. Well, Father, we have you for just a couple more minutes, maybe to, to kind of, you know, uh, bring it to a, in in my opinion, what's what's a good you know epilogue you know for for this kind of discussion is is you know the the power of 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 Christ in this the love of God that that wants so much to set us free from these sorts of things and to give us a better alternative for sure. Um, I mean, what what kinds of advice might you have just just kind of in in parting here for folks who, um, uh, you know, might not really know what a, a good kind of daily routine or if there's mm-hmm. some 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 prayers or just some good practical tips, you know, for, for us to make sure we're, um, you know, keeping ourselves on the right path, especially if someone maybe has been dabbling or they've been leaning, you know, towards for some of these, these associations or these activities that might be a little problematic to say the least. You know, a lot of people at some point in their life may have engaged in some activity. The good news is that the human person, we have the capacity to grow in holiness and virtue. We can say that was a really dumb thing to do and we can repent. (laughs) We touched on Mm -hmm. the importance of sacramental confession. I always say that as Catholics, if we're doing these following things, the devil is already on the run. If we're going to Mass, if we're praying, if we're reading the Bible, if we're celebrating the sacramental life of the Church, again, confession, going to communion, and then if we know and live our faith, the devil is already on the run. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to do anything extraordinary to defeat the devil. It is the very ordinary aspects of our Catholic faith that will always keep the devil at bay. I just think there's a lot of people today that don't have a true appreciation for the tools, if you will, that the Church has given us Hmm. to defeat the demonic one. It's almost like the keys to defeating him are in our hands, but until we actually (laughs) put them in the door and unlock it, they're not really going to do us any good. So again, 
nothing extraordinary to defeat the devil. It is the ordinary aspects of our faith that will defeat him. You know, the sure. devil has power. He can only be defeated by power. The power that defeats him is the power of God. And the ministry of exorcism is one of the ways that we call upon this power of God. And ultimately, God wins. We know the end of the story already. So if we know the end of the story, why would anyone choose to be on the side of the evil one? We just need to be on the side of God. Amen. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Father, for joining us here today and, and sharing you know, your experience here. And uh, if anyone wants to, to get in touch with you, is there you know, any in particular way that you, know, you, you recommend that? Or I would say that you can go on, you know, if you go out there on, anywhere on social media, you'll find my name. Sure. I will say to mm -hmm. any of your listeners that, mm -hmm. you know, I only use email. I do know mm -hmm. that there's a few people out there that have created some false Facebook accounts and things with my image and likeness. Oh, okay. And they're, they're trying to take advantage of people's brokenness, unfortunately, mm. for, the, uh, for the almighty dollar. Yeah. So uh, the best way would be for people to, uh, to send me an email. Any other avenue sure. would not be legitimate. Sure. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. So, well, thank you, Father, very much for, for joining us here today. And I, I can't thank you enough. Yes, my pleasure, Mike. Good to be with yep. you. You too. I am so humbled and grateful that Father was able to share his time with us here today uh, and really just personally uh, feel a debt of gratitude of being able to share with him, you know, my story and share with all of you. I hadn't planned that ahead of time, but that was um, an experience that was the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced. It was only a few moments and uh, and something that really, in one sense, you know, gave me just a little taste of the reality of this stuff. Um, I am absolutely confident at the deepest level that it was not just some sort of hallucination or dream. I was wide awake. And I just, I can only tell you, you just have to, you know, uh, take my word for it if you're willing to, <laughs> that it was a profoundly uh, real and personal experience that uh, I, I really appreciate his thoughts on that, you know, and uh, am profoundly thankful to our Lord. Um, I have tasted firsthand in so many different ways. Uh, that was maybe the most extreme one. It's just the power of Christ and in his presence and his desire to save us, to be there for us, to call us to a true, meaningful, beautiful destiny. Every one of us, every one of you. And there are so many lies out there right now, so many deceptive trends and voices in our culture. So much darkness, so much foolishness, um, posing as as wisdom and posing as as um, you know legitimate sources of meaning and and uh, movements to be part of that give you meaning and purpose. Christ gives you meaning and purpose. He is your creator. He's your savior. And I really encourage you if if you uh, are watching this and you're at all uh, concerned, look up. Father Lampert. I have his contact info below. Look up Father Zeta. You know, see if there's an exorcist in your area. You know, it can't hurt to reach out to them if you sincerely are wondering if this is something that might be affecting your life. So I want to encourage you, don't be afraid. Know that you're in my prayers. Know that this is uh, real and it's serious, but nothing comes close to the glory and the power of Christ, the sacraments. And I want to end with the St. Michael prayer because the angels, as Father mentioned, the angels are so powerful. They're so much more powerful than the demons who so foolishly uh, gave up what they could have been. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And we thank our Lord, first and foremost, for this beautiful prayer from uh, Pope Leo XIII, who taught us how to pray. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. And we also ask all of our holy guardian angels to pray for us, to protect us from all evil, and to show us the lighted path ahead that the Lord wills for us to walk each day. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all, and have a very, very blessed uh, day and, uh, and week ahead of you. So take care, and I'll see you next time on The Gracious Guest Show. <laughs>